Today will be held in English, French, and Portuguese. So, reminder to our audience that we have simultaneous translation. Nous aurons également des participants en ligne qui vont rejoindre les discussions et nous vous prions, s'il vous plaît, de respecter les mesures anti-COVID-19. For this opening session, I'm privileged to introduce the two speakers. Mrs. Winnie Banyema, bienvenue au Sénégal. Winnie is the Executive Director of UNS and Under Secretary General of the United Nations. Her Excellency, welcome to Senegal. Bienvenue chez vous. Mrs. Fatima Madabio, who is the First Lady of the Republic of Sierra Leone. And to start us off, I wish to extend a very warm welcome to all of you and to all our participants. Mini, thank you. And thank you also to all the other UN leaders for spearheading education class. A game changer for girls and young women, for gender justice and the future of our continent. And to learn more about the initiative Education Plus, plus follow the hashtag on social media, but also on its website. The website is www.unaids slash and slash topics slash education plus. And let me now turn to Her Excellency, Mrs. Fatima Madabio, First Lady of the Republic of Sierra Leone. Your Excellency, Sierra Leone was the first country to publicly announce the commitment to champion the Education Plus initiative by the President Julius Mada Bio. Thank you for that commitment. Could you, could you please provide us with a few highlights on the progress made so far on the initiative? Please. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, it is indeed a great pleasure and honor to join my sister, Ms. Winnie, the UNAIDS Executive Director, to discuss an issue that is dearest to my heart, promoting and protecting the rights of adolescent girls and young women towards realizing their full potentials. First of all, let me take the opportunity to thank the government of Senegal for hosting myself, our Minister of Health, and our delegation since we arrived here on Saturday. And I want to thank UNAID for inviting me to be one of the voices of the voiceless of this continent. The evidence has shown us that HIV epidemic in West and Central Africa is more feminized with women and girls bearing the brunt of new HIV infections and cares for people living with HIV. The disproportionate high HIV infection among women and girls is fueled by systematic, structured, a structural and institutionalized gender inequality that puts women and girls at a disadvantage throughout the life cycle. In Sierra Leone, HIV prevalence among women stands at 2.2%. Is double the rate among men, 1.1% for adults 15 years and above. 
Similarly, adolescent girls and young women aged 15 to 24 years are three times 1.5% more likely to be infected with HIV than their male counterpart, which is at 0.5%. And the root cause, as far as I'm concerned, is child marriage, sexual and gender-based violence, harmful cultural practices, gender norms, limited knowledge on HIV, and sexual reproductive health had significantly contributed to unplanned pregnancies, high rate of school dropout, increased vulnerabilities of women and girls to HIV infections across the continent. I know you will ask me why I thought um, child marriage is um, one of the reasons. For me, child marriage is a legalized way of saying rape is acceptable in our continent. So we have to deal with that problem. Child marriage in Africa is something that is happening and we don't want to talk about it. And if we are going to be shipping off our girls to be married as a child, the tendency of them ending up with HIV is, it's like 90%. When my husband, His Excellency President Julius Madabio took office in 2018, we noted how women and girls' vulnerability was a major obstacle to achieving the Human Capital Development Agenda, which is the main theme for the Sierra Leone National Midterm Development Plan. He therefore had to take some very radical measures to ensure that women and girls are not left behind in national development, but become the pillar around which our national development goals are achieved. Permit me to highlight a few of the key interventions that the government of Sierra Leone has put in place to address the underlying gender inequality and the creation of a safe and conducive environment for women and girls to thrive as equal and valuable citizens of Africa, or more especially Sierra Leone. In 2018, I had the privilege to host six other first ladies who joined me to march to launch my flagship program, the Hands of Our Girls campaign, and participated in a street procession to draw attention, to draw national attention to the high rate of sexual violence in Sierra Leone at that time. And that's the first time African first ladies came together to voice out our frustration. The advocacy campaign has engaged traditional, religious, and political leaders in all districts and 193 chiefdoms to eliminate all forms of sexual and gender-based violence. Child marriage, teenage pregnancies, HIV, cervical cancer, and advancement of economic empowerment for girls. The campaign is currently leading government effort to establish a comprehensive one-stop center and safe home for SGBV survivors and a forensic DNA lab to accelerate the prosecution of SGB cases. Recognizing the impact of menstrual hygiene as girls' attendance and retention in school, the Hands of Our Girls campaign has introduced free sanitary pads for vulnerable girls in government and government-assisted schools. Each girl gets a pack of 120 sanitary pads, which is adequate to last them for the year. I know you'll be wondering what sanitary pad has to do with HIV and AIDS. The thing is, we don't talk about menstruation to our kids. We don't discuss this in Africa. Our fathers don't. And for a girl in Africa who depend on a man to buy them sanitary pads, eventually that man will end up asking them for sex. And that's the reason why I felt that for my girls to be safe from um, perpetrators and pedophiles, we have to provide them with sanitary pads because menstruation is not a choice. Sex is a choice.
if we can give condoms free in every hotels and every stops, I think we should also give our girls free sanitary pads. <laughs> Recognizing the effectiveness and impact of this program, the free sanitary pads, the government has adopted this as a national program to be funded with public sector resources. Our menstruation, our menstruation is not a choice slogan has significantly boosted girls' confidence and reduced menstruation-related stigma. Please, let's talk about menstruation because it's happening. Please. In 2019, His Excellency President Julius Marubio declared rape as a public health emergency. Consequently, I had to put together a presidential task force chaired by the President this tax force was constituted to give the issue the highest political attention it deserves. The tax force has facilitated the amendment of the Sexual Offenses Act to impose much stricter punishment for sexual offenders, established SGBV model court to accelerate, to accelerate prosecutions of sexual offenses, Six new one-stop centers has also been established and reporting of SGBV cases is being digitalized across the country. And very soon, we're going to have a list for pedophiles and we'll show their faces to the nations. Comprehensive sexuality education curriculum has been developed and currently been rolled out in basic and secondary schools. We feel that it is more necessary for us now with the digital world that we're living for our girls to know the dangers of sex. And you can only do that by having that conversation with them. The Teenage Pregnancy Directorate is being strengthened through the establishment of a strong multi-sectoral school health program that guarantees access to sexual and reproductive health services. Realizing that education is a social vaccine for gender inequality and economic empowerment of women and girls, the government has instituted free quality for all free quality education for all children in pre-primary, to primary and secondary school. This is complemented by free school buses, free school feeding free uniforms and textbooks for children in deprived communities. This has significantly increased the enrollment, attendance, and retention of girls in particular, and achievement of parity in primary and secondary schools. The government also foots the cost of public examinations, fees including the West African Senior Secondary School exam, in pursuit of the government of Syria's human capital development agenda, a total of 22% of our national GDP is now spent on education alone. The government of Syria has also instituted a science, technology, engineering, and mathematics STEM scholarship for all girls with the view of motivating and producing future generation of women scientists to lead our country's development. As part of the radical inclusion policy, the government has established the policy that prohibited pregnant girls from attending school, therefore by creating opportunities for pregnant girls to complete school and achieve their dreams. Children with disability are now more than ever before have access to education advancement. When I was one of the people who was really against the radical inclusion, because I felt like when a girl is pregnant, they need to be home. But then after engaging young girls in Sierra Leone and understanding their plight, I then realized that if we are to exclude our girls who are pregnant, not by their own choice, from going to school, that means we are victimizing them twice. So we need to give them the opportunity so that the perpetrator or whoever did that to them did not win the fight. <laughs> the gender equality and women empowerment policy has been developed and cabinet has approved the gender empowerment bill for parliament 
as I'm speaking to you, is now in Parliament. Additionally, the National Male Engagement Policy has been launched by the President to improve the involvement of men and boys in addressing gender inequality in the country. Now, a lot of people will say, well, President Bio is doing this because he's in love, he is in love with his wife. A man should love his wife. But I don't think that's the case. I don't think that's the case here. His Excellency believed that for Sierra Leone to move to the level that he wants to see Sierra Leone, he cannot keep women in the kitchen. He believed that the women should join them. The women should also have the opportunity to be partners in development. We should not only have women clapping and dancing at the shadow. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, while recognizing the effectiveness of this action in empowering the adolescent girls and young women, Sierra Leone recognized the great potentials and benefit of the Education Plus initiative in enhancing our commitment as a country to protect and promote the right of adolescents and young women towards fulfilling their full potential. And that's the reason why we're here today. If we're talking about education, it's not just a statement. But if we educate our women, they will understand how to take care of themselves. If we educate our women, they will know what HIV is all about. And they will be able to protect themselves. And if in an event that they had the unfortunate situation of contracting this disease, they will be able to manage themselves because we know this is a disease that you can live with as long as you take care of yourself and take the right medication and follow the advice that is given to you. So our focus is making sure our girls are kept in school, retained in school, and let them finish so that they have, a, they have the mind of their own and they can make a decision that is their own decision, not one that is imposed on them. It is for this reason that Sierra Leone was the first country to officially announce her participation in the Education Plus initiative. In addition to the Minister of Basic and Secondary Education active participation in the official launch in June 2021, his Excellency the President has expressed Sierra Leone's commitment to the initiative in a video recording that is available on the Education Plus website. That man is serious when it comes to women's issue. Obviously, Sierra Leone is on track to achieving the five Education Plus approach even before they came to us. Completion of quality secondary school is a must for us in Sierra Leone. Universal access to comprehensive sexuality education. We have to enlighten our girls if we want them to be protected. Fulfillment of sexual and reproductive health and their rights. When the girls know their rights, they do the right thing. It's only when you don't know what is right for you, that's when you ask yourself, if only I had known. Freedom from gender-based and sexual violence. A civilized nation should not live in a world where women should be fear of living around men. Gender-based violence is a very uncivilized thing and we need to put a stop to that. School to work transition and economic security and empowerment. For now, that is one of the things that the president of Sierra Leone is trying to do. Because yes, we now have more girls going to school, more girls determined to finish their education, and then when they finish, what next? And that is what we are preparing for because we don't want to wait until that what next comes. Although the government of Sierra Leone has made significant investment in providing free primary and secondary education, a lot more investment are still required to fully achieve our free and quality education for girls and boys of school going age. Additionally, investment are required to expand on school infrastructure, health, water and sanitation, appropriate teaching and learning uh, technologies and tools will be critical in facilitating school completion and transition from school to work. 
It is therefore imperative that we intensify investment, global solidarity and partnership with bilateral and multilateral partners such as the African Development Bank, the United Nations, the World Bank, European Union, and the Global Partnership for Education to improve quality and access to free secondary education as part of gender equality and women empowerment on the African continent. The current generation is bombarded daily with a lot of information and misinformation through social media. It is therefore critical that all African countries invest resources in providing age-appropriate and culturally sensitive, comprehensive sexuality education for all students. Making comprehensive sexuality education examination examinable either as standalone curriculum or integrated to existing curriculum will be crucial. We need to have a regional approach and invest in teachers' training and instructional, and instructional materials backed by peer support to scale up comprehensive sexuality education on all countries. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, you will agree with me that access to sexual and reproductive health rights and services remain a challenge for many young people in Africa. Hence the high rate of teenage pregnancy and HIV infections. Not only are youth-friendly centers inaccessible, but poor service providers' attitude and quality of service and inadequate equipment has restricted access to youth-friendly services. Many of our young people still lack agencies and autonomy over their bodies. We need new innovative interventions and investments to make youth-friendly services available in our countries to ensure that the sexual and reproductive needs of young people, and particularly girls, are addressed in a non-judgmental, non-discriminatory, and stigma-free environment. The time has come for us to end all forms of gender and, base, and sexual based violence. I started hearing this word gender and sexual based violence since I was a little girl and we're still talking about we need to end it. Now, when are we going to end it? Because I don't want to announce my age here now. <laughs> but I've been hearing this since like I was five. So it's like, you know, since five to now, we're talking about 35 years, we're still talking. When are we going to act? Our silence makes us complacent to the sufferings and pains of many girls who suffer sexual violences. Sexual violence as a weapon of war, sexual harassment, exploitation and abuse. We as a continent must stand together to criminalize all forms of child marriage in the West and Central African region. The time is now for ECOWAS leaders to take this bold action to protect adolescent girls and young women from early marriage. Because early marriage is a certified way of saying rape is acceptable. On the sideline of the UN General Assembly, I have proposed the dedication of April 8 each year as, a nation, as an international day for sexual violence survivors. We must recognize and support them for their courage and resilience. On top of prevention measures, providing survival access to high quality one-stop centers that provide comprehensive legal, medical, and social support should be our collective national and regional policy. We need to tackle economic justice and opportunities by working to achieve the fifth pillar of the Education Plus Initiative, which focuses on school to work transition, economic security, and empowerment. This will require strong partnership with the private sector, creating opportunities for science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. The STEM will better prepare adolescent girls for the 
digital economy and innovation. We can and we must strengthen women and girls' access to livelihood skills and opportunities to make themselves sufficient. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, as you will agree again, our country has signed, our countries in our continent have signed many agreements and commitments that are not adequately monitored. If you can't do it, don't sign it. It's better. Tracking and reporting on it, we need to track and report them. And I think we need to call out the countries that are not doing the right thing. For the Education Plus initiative to be successful, I would strongly suggest that we establish a regional scorecard with clear indicators on the five pillars that will help us to collectively report and compare progress on the implementation of Education Plus initiative in the West and Central African region. Finally, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, as we collectively strive to end COVID-19 and HIV and AIDS as a public health threat, we need to recommit ourselves to build back better societies that guarantee adolescent girls and young women access to secondary and higher education in safe and secure environment where their rights are protected and promoted towards the realization of their full potentials. This is not the time to reverse the gain we have already made. We need to front load investment to promote the Education Plus initiative in order to achieve a more just, equal, and well-educated society. Let us all remember as Dr. K. A. Bosia, a former Prime Minister of Ghana, puts, in, puts it, if you educate a man, you educate an individual. But if you educate a woman, you educate a nation. No hard feeling, guys, but that's the truth. Let's work together. Let's work together in the spirit of global solidarity and partnership to make the world a better place for adolescent girls and young women. The time to act is yesterday, today, and not tomorrow. Thank you so very much. Thank you, Mr. Thank you for setting us up. This is Fatima Madabi. I applaud your country, but also your personal leadership for leading the way with your commitment to the rights and empowerment of adolescent girls and women. Thank you. I would like now to introduce Divini Bani Diyanima. UNAIDS Executive Director, a global fighter against inequalities, but also peace advocates for adolescent and girls' education. So thank you for having me. Minister Benin du Gabon et du Sénégal, représentant d'organisations de la société civile, des réseaux de jeunes, d'agences des Nations Unies, distingués participants. Je suis ravie de me joindre à vous aujourd'hui pour cet événement de haut niveau sur l'initiative Éducation Plus. Nous nous engageons dans des délibérations qui donneront notre temps aux actions accélérées et aux investissements renforcés nécessaires pour garantir que chaque fille africaine soit scolarisée en sécurité, en bonne santé et forte, en réduisant la vulnérabilité des adolescents et des jeunes femmes au VIH. That's as much French as I can try. <laughs> Every week, nearly 1,000 
adolescent girls in Western Central Africa are newly infected with HIV, changing their life journey. 1,000 a year. Let's visualize this. A thousand adolescent girls and young women would fill up 40 of the buses you see in Dakar. 40 bus loads. 40 bus loads of our girls, young women, being infected with HIV every week. This is the scale of the problem. Four young girls, four girls, four young women. Gender inequalities continue to drive the HIV epidemic in this region. And young girls, girls and young women make up three quarters of new HIV infections. This is about between the age of 15 and 24. Three quarters of those newly infected are girls and young women. And that's, that is the age when people are very sexually active. New infections aren't happening very much amongst people of my age. New infections are happening very much amongst young people. Three quarters of these are girls, young women. Then, not only do they have a high risk of contracting HIV, but the challenges they have in accessing services are also enormous. Their population and legal barriers. But we know the solutions to this. We know that completing quality secondary education for girls can reduce HIV infection by up to 50%. It has done so in some countries. We know this from the evidence. But, but we also know that even if girls can access secondary school and complete it, they continue to face barriers to learning and even to completing the education. You see, what are those barriers? It's discriminatory policies, as the First Lady has just said, that if a girl, by one accident, gets pregnant, that she may not return to school. We have such policies still in place, that one accident in a girl's life costs her her entire future. These include, the barriers include, early marriages that the First Lady has spoken about. By the way, it touched my heart. It really touched our hearts. You saw the clap, you heard the claps. Early marriages, teenage pregnancies. The burden of care work at home also keeps girls out of school. Gender-based violence that you spoke so well about poverty, conflict, displacement, all these issues hurt girls disproportionately. But we know what works, as I've said, to break this cycle of gender inequalities. We know what works to transform the futures of adolescent girls and young women. We know what works to drive multiple social and economic benefits for their families and for countries. We've tried it, we've piloted with partners here, PEPFAR and others. So I would like to remind us that this region is part of the world that adopted in June this year a new global aid strategy, which put some milestones towards ending AIDS by 2030. There was a new political commitment. And three things that we know will work that are part of this strategy to end this 
the inequalities that drive, the barriers that are in the way for girls to prevent infection of HIV and gain many other benefits. One, to scale up financing and investments. Most countries in the region haven't met yet the African Union's Dakar commitment on education to allocate 20% of government resources to education. We've just heard, we've been challenged by Sierra Leone putting 28% of its budget in education. We need to work hard, push our governments, encourage them to move to reach the 20% commitment. Even before COVID and its disruption of education, only five countries in this region of Western Central Africa had allocated 50%. That's Burkina Faso, Sao Tome and Principe, Senegal, Sierra Leone and Togo. Others still have a journey, and we're here to support them to get there. The funding gap to reach that uh, SDG number four in education will increase enormously, we know, because of COVID. But we can't give up urgent action now. Governments need to plug this gap by scaling up investment in secondary education. It's already there on primary education, and we made this gain in the last 20 years. We can make it for secondary education again. The second, I remember I mentioned three things. The second is to end discriminatory policies, laws, and practices that deny girls their right to education and retrench other inequalities. I mentioned that a key barrier for girls is poverty. Poverty. In many countries, low-income households, particularly in rural areas, and other marginalized groups can't afford the cost of education. Not just, even when the fees are not there, they can't afford the other costs, the transportation, the school uniform, the books, and other things that are required. So free, free, truly free secondary education is essential. It's absolutely critical. That is the way we'll be sure that a girl is in a classroom up to the age of 16. Other actions include non-discrimination against students on the grounds of gender, HIV status, disability, pregnancy status, marital status, and all of that. We need to scrap all those policies that make, that restrain or that are barriers to girls continued education. And these policies are deeply entrenched in our countries. You know, they are supported by families, they are supported by religious leaders, traditional leaders, and policy makers themselves. So we've got to work to persuade conservatives, conservative constituencies to see why it is important for a girl to have access without any discrimination. We need also whole of education approaches which include both measures to prevent violence in the school space, to ensure that girls have the tools they need, the services they need to prevent or to stand up against violence, sexual harassment, and so on. The school space is not a safe space today. Girls are vulnerable even in the school space, predated upon even by those who should care, teachers and others, who get away with it lightly. It was inspiring to hear that a country like Sierra, that Sierra Leone is taking action to take violence, sexual harassment out of the school space and to punish, to punish predators to punish those who prey on girls. The third is to introduce a package of health and other services for adolescent girls 
in and around the secondary schools. Comprehensive sexuality education is key. We've heard about that. If a girl doesn't know about her body, if she doesn't know about her choices, if she doesn't know, then she cannot prevent HIV infection and she cannot be a healthy girl. Access to sexual reproductive health services and services or prevention of gender-based violence. There's a whole debate about what is proper and what is not for our girls. For me, the litmus test is that which helps a girl to prevent violence against her and that which helps her to control her body and be healthy. To me, that is what is key. Every country must define those services and place them there for girls and young women. Menstrual health management, we've heard about that. You couldn't have put it better. Water, sanitation, and hygiene services. These, you could say, are neutral, but they're not. If they are not there, they hurt a girl more than a boy. I know this. I went to a school in a rural area. If there was no toilet nearby, if there were no, no water nearby, it meant something different for a girl who's in her menstrual period than for a boy. So having water, having hygiene, having sanitation services at school is key to keep girls in school. Then tackling toxic masculinities. Sexual education for our boys. Boys to understand that to be strong doesn't mean to force a girl. That to be strong and to be a boy doesn't mean that you say that you don't respect a no from a girl. So changing the mindsets of young boys at an early age so that they are healthy and they know that they are male and they are strong and they are capable without being forceful and predating on girls. That's how we tackle sexual violence in society. The tolerance of sexual violence has to be attacked by educating boys differently. At school and at home, these are things we can do. These are not out of our means. These are things we can introduce in the schools, these are things we can share with our communities through a community development approach, and we can change the way we look after our children at school, our girls at school, at home, and on the way home. That's why we are excited about this initiative, Education Plus Initiative, on the empowerment of girls and young women in Sub-Saharan Africa. We, I mean, our partnership. When you hear UNAIDS, many times you think that UNAIDS is us whom you see who are often in front of you as UNAIDS. We are only a part of it. We are the secretariat of a joint partnership. I say we who own this initiative, we are partners within the joint program. That's us, the secretariat, and I who leads it, together with UNESCO, which is part of the joint partnership, UNICEF, UNFPA, and UN Women. All these agencies each has a mandate to support the empowerment of girls and young women. We've brought our mandates together, like they were brought together to fight HIV AIDS. We come together to tackle one important area to use it as an entry point, an important area of education, in order to protect girls in this region from being infected with HIV, to reduce their high vulnerability to HIV, and to get all the other benefits that come with education for girls, like reducing the rate of early marriages, like reducing teenage pregnancy, like healthy young women, like raising uh, the 
capability of a girl to earn, to go out of school and earn an income, and so on. So in partnership with governments, with civil society organizations, especially young women's organizations, girls' rights associations, and other stakeholders, this initiative is a bold call to action centered on increasing investments in education, secondary education, putting in place the policies that would guarantee free, quality education for all girls and boys, ensuring the girls' safety in the school space. With secondary education as its entry point, the initiative calls for a multi-sectoral package that you have heard so well articulated by the First Lady of Sierra Leone. Comprehensive sexuality education, sexual reproductive health and rights, freedom from gender-based violence, school-to-work transitions. This core package will protect girls against HIV with other socioeconomic benefits. So the initiative is a catalyzer. It is, it is a catalyzer for the implementation of political commitments that were made in this region to end AIDS as a public health threat by 2030. It catalyzes. It's not the only solution, but it catalyzes, it accelerates our progress towards ending AIDS. We can do this together. Civil society in this room, we need you to bring in as many other organizations of civil society, those which work on girls' education, those that work on girls' rights, those that work on violence against girls and women, those that work on increased budget allocations for social sectors. These are all important for us to get our governments, support our governments, to put the money where it should be in girls' education in order to reduce their vulnerability to HIV. It's not the only solution, but it's a very important entry point that we must use to reduce girls' vulnerability to HIV in the Western Central African region. I thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mimi, for spearheading, again, as I said earlier, this Game Changer, Education Plus, and for reminding us the intersectionality of uh, many issues. And thank you both, uh, Her Excellency, for these great contributions, and also for this advocating for a multi prong approach, but also a multi stakeholder approach. Thank you all. We are going now to move to the panel discussions. Sans plus tarder, j'ai maintenant le plaisir de vous faire passer aux différentes tables rondes interactives qu'on aura ce matin. Nous allons aborder la thématique suivante des engagements aux actions euh, tirés parti de l'éducation pour la prévention du VIH et de l'égalité des sexes en Afrique de l'Ouest et du Centre. Et pour ce premier panel, nous aurons euh, à recevoir des intervenants. Euh, nous allons accueillir Madame Shibanda Félicité, euh, qui est directrice régionale adjointe de l'UICEF pour l'Afrique de l'Ouest et du Centre. Bienvenue. Nous allons aussi accueillir en mode virtuel tout à l'heure euh, Son Excellence Monsieur Kwaru Ifshabi, qui est le ministre des enseignements secondaires techniques et professionnels de la République du Bénin. Nous allons aussi accueillir Docteur Safiye Tuchyam qui est la directrice exécutive du Conseil national de lutte contre le sida du Sénégal. Bienvenue. Nous allons aussi accueillir euh, Mademoiselle Fatima Gomez, euh, qui est la conseillère consultative euh, pour le Fonds pour les, jeunes, euh, les femmes et les jeunes femmes leaders de l'initiative Éducation Plus. Bienvenue aussi. Nous allons aussi recevoir toujours euh, parmi nos invités qui vont nous rejoindre en mode virtuel, Madame Ouraï euh, Mamadou Anne, qui est la chef du bureau euh, régional des forums des éducatrices africaines, FAE, euh, du Sénégal, qui va nous rejoindre aussi. Et en dernier lieu, nous aurons M. Manuel Tonard, qui est euh, le directeur à la direction de la coopération et au développement euh, et de l'action humanitaire qui vient de Luxembourg. Donc nous allons sans plus tarder commencer ce panel avec euh, Madame Shibanda. Euh, et la 
la première question euh, par rapport à ce problème-là. D'un point de vue régional, euh, dans l'Afrique occidentale et centrale, quelles sont les perspectives en matière euh, de financement d'éducation secondaire euh, de qualité gratuite pour toutes les filles et pour de, tous les garçons Je veux vous passer le micro. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup. Euh, je voudrais euh, remercier euh, le discours euh, vraiment inspirant de son Excellence euh, Madame la Première Dame de Sierra Leone ainsi que euh, le discours de Madame la Directrice Exécutive de ONU SIDA euh, à tous mes collègues euh, panélistes du protocole observé. Euh, je voulais d'abord, euh, au nom de la Directrice Régionale de l'UNICEF, pour l'Afrique de l'Ouest et du Centre, qui aurait aimé être avec vous, vous remercier d'avoir associé l'UNICEF à cette session, qui touche un sujet d'importance capitale, financer un enseignement secondaire de qualité et gratuit pour toutes les filles et tous les garçons en Afrique. Tout d'abord, nous devons savoir que dans, dans notre région, il y a environ 36 millions d'enfants en âge d'être scolarisé dans le primaire et le premier cycle du secondaire qui ne sont pas à l'école. Les filles représentent plus de la moitié de cet effectif. Les adolescentes euh, qui atteignent le deuxième cycle de l'enseignement primaire et, et le premier cycle de l'enseignement secondaire sont confrontées à des multiples obstacles. Et c'est pour ça que nous pensons que pour y, rém y remédier, on en a déjà parlé, nous devons adopter une approche multisectorielle afin de lever ces obstacles liés non seulement à leur éducation, mais aussi à leurs besoins en matière d'économie, de protection, de nutrition, de santé, d'hygiène menstruelle et de prévention du VIH. Nous l'avons aussi entendu, la plupart des pays d'Afrique de l'Ouest et du Centre n'atteignent pas l'objectif minimum de 20% du budget national investi dans l'éducation. Cet objectif a été, avait été fixé dans le cadre de l'engagement de Dakar sur l'éducation pour tous. En 2019, seulement 14 pays, le Burkina, le Sao Tome du Principe, la Sierra Leone et le Togo ont dépassé cet objectif. Dans la majorité des pays, les budgets de l'éducation sont utilisés de manière inéquitable. Un enfant issus de 20% des ménages les plus riches peut bénéficier de jusqu'à 12, pour, pour 12 fois plus de ressources gouvernementales qu'un enfant issu de 20% des ménages les plus pauvres. Donc non seulement nous avons euh, le besoin d'avoir le niveau d'investissement à 20%, mais nous devons regarder la question de l'inégalité dans la distribution de ce budget. Dans beaucoup de pays, la quasi-totalité des dépenses d'éducation va au salaire des enseignants, ce qui laisse très peu de marge pour investir dans le matériel d'apprentissage et les infrastructures comme les salles de classe. De nombreux pays africains pourraient atteindre la scolarisation primaire universelle en améliorant l'efficacité de leurs dépenses d'éducation. En guise d'exemple, des études sur l'absentéisme des enseignants ont montré que les pays d'Afrique de l'Ouest et du Centre perdent environ 1,5% du produit intérieur brut chaque année en raison de l'absentéisme des enseignants. Garder les filles dans les écoles, en particulier dans les écoles secondaires du premier cycle, doit être notre priorité absolue, nous l'avons compris. Le coût de l'inaction est très élevé pour toutes nos économies et sociétés. Euh, avant tout, l'inaction a un impact négatif sur la réalisation des droits des filles et leur capacité à développer leur plein potentiel. On dit ici qu'un euh, foyer ne peut pas être sur une, une chaise bancale, on a besoin des deux, et donc on a vraiment besoin de, euh, des, des, des jeunes filles euh, pour développer nos pays, pour participer au développement euh, de nos pays. Au moment où nous faisons face à la pandémie de COVID-19 et à son impact socio-économique, nous devons plaider ensemble afin de sécuriser les allocations du budget pour l'éducation. Euh, la pandémie nous a montré qu'on peut faire les choses différemment, qu'on peut explorer des opportunités telles que la digitalisation, 
pour accroître l'accès et la qualité de l'éducation. Une étude de la Banque mondiale sur les coûts liés à l'absence d'éducation des filles a révélé que si toutes les filles du monde terminaient le premier cycle de l'enseignement secondaire, à savoir 12 années d'études de qualité, les revenus à vie des femmes pourraient augmenter de 15 000 milliards de dollars à l'échelle mondiale. Cela conduirait également à des multiples dividendes pour les sociétés africaines. Je pense que nous avons tous les éléments pour nous assurer que ce plaidoyer sera non pas simplement sur papier, non pas seulement, seulement des paroles, mais des actions. Uh, it's time to act, comme a dit la première dame, and uh, it's almost too late, so we need to do it now. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Merci, Madame Chibanda, pour cet euh, aperçu complet. Euh, vous avez préparé le terrain pour les discussions euh, qui vont suivre. Notre prochain intervenant va nous rejoindre virtuellement. Euh, il nous vient du Bénin. Quelques minutes pour pouvoir assurer la connexion. Il est là. Bonjour Excellence. Je vous présente maintenant euh, Son Excellence, Monsieur Kouaou Ifchawi, qui est le ministre des enseignements euh, secondaires, techniques et professionnels de la République du Bénin et qui nous rejoint euh, ce matin pour ce panel, pour sa contribution. Bonjour Son Excellence. Vous nous entendez Bonjour, très bien. Merci. Oui, je vous entends, je vous reçois très, très bien. Bonjour Son Excellence, merci de nous rejoindre virtuellement pour assister à ce panel. Et aujourd'hui, le Bénin est un pays champion d'initiative Éducation Plus. Quelles sont les mesures politiques et programmatiques prises par votre pays pour financer un enseignement secondaire gratuit et de qualité avec l'initiative Éducation Plus comme point de départ Je voudrais... D'abord, vous remercier pour l'initiative que vous nous donnez de, part, de partager l'expérience de mon pays, le Bénin, avec les autres pays. Alors, le gouvernement du Bénin, à l'instar de celui des autres pays, engagé dans la mise en œuvre de l'initiative Passion Plus, a inscrit parmi. Ah oui. Vous pouvez retrouver maintenant Oui, nous vous entendons, Excellence. Voilà, qu'est-ce qu'il faut faire là Nous vous recevons, Son Excellence. Pour l'équipe technique, c'est bon D'accord. Ce sont les interprètes qui ne vous entendent pas. L'équipe technique est en train de faire le nécessaire. D'accord. C'est bon maintenant C'est bien C'est ok. C'est ok, c'est bon maintenant. Vous pouvez y aller, okay. c'est bon. Merci bien. Alors, je disais tantôt que le gouvernement du Bénin, à l'instar de celui des autres pays, la plus a inscrit parmi les priorités de son programme d'action l'amélioration des performances de l'éducation comme base de relance du développement national. Cette ambition, traduite par le programme d'action du gouvernement 2016-2021 et le plan sectoriel de l'éducation PSE post-2015 pour la période 2018 à 2030, inscrit dans la mise en œuvre de l'ODD4 qui vise à assurer l'accès de tous à une éducation de qualité une, sur un pied d'égalité et prévoir les possibilités d'apprentissage tout au long de la vie. Pour y être arrivé, le gouvernement du Bénin s'est engagé dans des réformes qui visent l'amélioration de l'accès la rétention, l'équité et la qualité dans l'enseignement secondaire général et la formation technique et professionnelle. En effet, pour promouvoir l'accès de tous, tous 
à un enseignement secondaire gratuit, le Bénin a pris plusieurs mesures de politique éducative ces dernières années. C'est le cas notamment des mesures de gratuité des frais de scolarité dans les enseignements maternels et primaires, ainsi qu'au premier cycle de l'enseignement secondaire général et la filière sciences et techniques industrielles. Depuis 2006, le ministère de l'enseignement secondaire, technique et de la formation professionnelle du Bénin, avec l'appui financier de la DANIDA, du FASTRAC, finance la scolarité des filles du premier cycle de l'enseignement secondaire général. D'un montant de près de 80 est passé à plus de 3 000. Et pour l'enseignement technique, ce montant est à plus de 34 millions de francs CFA. Par ailleurs, la création de l'agence pour la construction des infrastructures du secteur de l'éducation vient apporter une solution adéquate dans l'accélération de la construction de salles de classe et de laboratoires en vue d'accroître les capacités d'accueil des établissements. Au titre de la gestion 2020, les travaux de cette agence ont permis d'avoir 49 modules de 4 salles de classe adapté aux enfants à besoins spécifiques pour une éducation inclusive. 98 blocs de latrine à 4 cabines séparés pour le respect du genre. Une subvention de plus de 916 millions de francs CFA est dégagée pour octroyer des bourses aux élèves de l'enseignement technique et de la formation professionnelle ainsi qu'une dotation de plus de 895 millions de francs CFA pour assurer le fonctionnement des lycées. Sur le plan de la qualité, des efforts sont faits en vue d'assurer un encadrement pédagogique des enseignants. Ainsi, plus de 3000 enseignants sont inspectés chaque année, suivis de rémédiations pédagogiques instantanées. Le gouvernement, pour pallier le problème de manque d'enseignants, s'est lancé dans une politique de dotation des établissements d'enseignants qualifiés. Ainsi, pour un budget seulement à plus de 18 milliards de francs CFA, 13 580 aspirants au métier d'enseignant ont été recrutés et mis à la disposition des établissements en 2021. Sur le plan social, le ministère a doté chacune de ces 12 directions départementales d'un service social scolaire dont la mission fondamentale est de travailler à la de la scolarisation des enfants, notamment les filles et les enfants en difficulté, avec un budget d'environ 20 millions, 20 millions chaque année. Les services socio-scolaires renforcent la protection des élèves à travers la vulgarisation des textes réprimant les harcèlements sexuels, les violences faites aux filles en milieu scolaire, la lutte contre le mariage précoce la sensibilisation des enfants sur les maladies sexuellement transmissibles et les grossesses en milieu scolaire, l'identification et la prise en charge des cas sociaux. Ces quelques actions phares pensées et mises en œuvre par le gouvernement du Bénin ont eu un impact positif sur le système éducatif et le gouvernement s'emploie à les perpétuer chaque année. Je vous remercie. Merci beaucoup. Merci, Monsieur le ministre pour votre intervention et pour tout ce que votre pays euh, fait pour que le financement d'éducation plus devienne une réalité. Merci beaucoup de nous avoir rejoints. Nous allons passer maintenant euh, à Dr euh, Safi Toutiam, euh, qui est la directrice exécutive du Conseil national de lutte contre le sida du Sénégal. Euh, bonjour Madame Tiam, Dr Tiam. Et euh, la question est par rapport euh, de votre point de vue. Comment pouvons-nous tirer parti du financement du secteur de la santé pour catalyser l'impact intersectoriel dans le secteur de l'éducation, en particulier pour garantir l'accès aux services de santé sexuelle et reproductive pour les adolescentes et les jeunes femmes Merci. Merci, euh, chère modératrice. Je voudrais à mon tour euh, saluer son excellence, madame la première dame, euh, de, de, de Sierra Leone et aussi euh, euh, saluer euh, l'Uni de l'ONU-SIDA et leur souhaiter la bienvenue au, au Sénégal. 
je voudrais rappeler la situation préoccupante euh, euh, ces derniers sont à risque qui ont des conséquences sur leur santé sur leur développement et sur leur vie future nous avons observé dans le cadre du VIH au Sénégal que les nouvelles infections baissent partout sauf dans la tranche d'âge des 15 24 ans. Nous avons aussi remarqué que malgré la faible prévalence du VIH chez les jeunes au Sénégal, les jeunes filles sont deux à trois fois plus infectées que les jeunes garçons. Les défis cruciaux à relever pour mettre fin à l'épidémie du sida chez les adolescents et les jeunes d'ici 2030 au Sénégal sont liés à la faible connaissance des moyens de prévention chez les jeunes adolescents, mais surtout chez les filles. 26% chez les filles, 33% chez les garçons. À la faible utilisation du préservatif, très faible chez les filles, 27%, 53% chez les garçons. À la faible connaissance d'un lieu de dépistage, 32% chez les filles, près de 55% chez les garçons. Il y a d'autres facteurs. Les premiers orateurs en ont parlé, c'est les grossesses précoces, les mariages des adolescentes, la fécondité des adolescentes, la consommation de drogue, l'alimentation, la nutrition des jeunes et des adolescentes, les violences euh, sous toutes formes, toutes ces formes, dans toutes ces formes. Il est important pour résoudre les questions de santé des adolescentes, il est important de promouvoir une approche holistique, une approche multisectorielle et prendre des mesures en vue de les protéger contre les risques sanitaires. Et résoudre ce grand défi implique de les intégrer dans la stratégie mondiale pour l'amélioration de la santé et du bien-être des femmes, des enfants et des adolescents. Mais ces stratégies pour la santé des adolescents doivent intégrer les priorités d'investissement dans le cadre du financement de la santé. Ça doit être un pilier important dans le cadre du financement de la santé. Les domaines d'intervention prioritaires parmi lesquels la promotion d'un paquet intégré d'interventions de santé sexuelle et reproductive des jeunes, des adolescents et des adolescentes à haut impact. L'équité et la demande de services de santé reproductive pour les jeunes, les adolescents et les adolescentes vulnérables. Les investissements pour améliorer la santé et l'éducation des adolescents, adolescentes et des jeunes filles se feront selon l'approche multisectorielle et contribueront à accélérer la transition démographique et donc potentialiser les chances de capter le dividende démographique. Il faut renforcer la communication pour le changement social et comportemental en faveur de la santé des adolescents et des jeunes. Il faut renforcer les compétences de vie des adolescentes en situation de vulnérabilité. Il faut renforcer l'offre de services adaptés aux besoins des adolescentes et des jeunes. Enfin, les acteurs pour catalyser cet impact multisectoriel dans le secteur de l'éducation, en particulier pour garantir les services de santé sexuelle et reproductive pour les adolescentes et les jeunes femmes, sont le gouvernement, la société civile, le secteur privé, les partenaires et les jeunes dans le cadre des stratégies all in. Au Sénégal, des progrès sont certes notés dans la scolarisation des filles. Ces progrès figurent parmi, parmi les plus significatifs en matière de réduction des inégalités de genre dans notre pays. Exemple, l'indice de parité dans le secondaire est passé de 0,96 à 1,0. C'est très faible, mais on note une légère progression en faveur des filles. Mais les échecs et les abandons sont plus importants chez les filles que chez les garçons. 
liés à plusieurs facteurs, les facteurs de vulnérabilité que j'ai cités tantôt, dont les, la grossesse précoce, les dans le financement. Une lawyer, un activiste, un champion pour girls et young women empowerment. Fatima is also an advisory counselor for the Global Fund for Women and Young Women Leader in Education Grant Initiative of the Gambia. Fatima, building from your work, already in morning, huh? building from your work at both national and international level, what are your key policy recommendations to government? And are the decision makers committed to financing free education, free and quality education, and secondary education? From the perspective of young girls and young women like yourself, what are the key recommendations? Um, is it morning? It's actually afternoon. Um, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, like she said, I'm Fatima Gomez and I'm from the Gambia. Um, but before I answer your question, I would just like to acknowledge the presence of um, the First Lady of Sierra Leone, Her Excellency, Mrs. Fatima Madabio, and also to acknowledge the presence of um, Mr. Sibini, the Director of General of EMAs. And to also acknowledge the presence of my colleague panelists and everyone here present. I can also see that the Minister of Health from my country is here present, and which is actually a plus because we are actually talking to the government. Um, so to answer your question about what you think, the, what recommendations I'm going to provide from an adolescent perspective and a young woman uh, perspective regards to um, government and those committed to providing free and quality education, what are the key things we should consider when making policies and investments in trying to accomplish this. Um, so I'm going to answer it. Um, first, I need to say that what I'm going to say is probably going to reflect on what the, um, um, the first lady has said and what Ms. Winnie has already talked about, because it's directly in alignment. Uh, but my points are going to be um, divided into five. Um, and the first thing I want to address is I think um, whoever, um, all donors who wants to invest into education, free and quality education or sec uh, secondary education, and also governments who are, who are supposed to be doing that, one thing, the first thing they should consider is um, investing in specific research about what actually secondary students need. Because if they keep assuming the needs of secondary students, for example, in one country, students do not even face the same challenges in schools. So if they keep assuming, oh, this is what students need, what they need is to be provided with books, what they need is to be provided with free tuition fees, or what they need is to be provided with um, teachers. And they, they, they provide that. And at the end of the day, that's not what students, for example, in the provinces actually need. So that's going to be a waste of resources because they provide what's not actually needed. And I think um, instead of just trying to concentrate and direct their energy in trying to address so face are uh, things that they say. They should try uh, to look for the root causes. Because if you keep addressing so face um, challenges or so face um, problems that we're facing, the root causes are still going to be there and it's still going to happen in generations to come. So I think the energy should be directed in trying to uproot the root causes. And with that, um, it's going to be a his it's going to be history and it's not going to be repeated. Uh, so one thing that um, needs to be done is. Um, you know the world is evolving. Um, the generation that was here 20 years ago, um, even some of them are still here, but comparing it to this generation, um, we see that we face, even though we might face similar challenges, but these challenges differ because of the uh, generation we are in, uh, because of the new things, things that are being innovated, because of the new things that we are discovering, and the challenges are kind of being modified. So that is why we need to look for things and we need to be progressively looking for data and research in order to be um, to, 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 to actually know what are the needs of the of secondary school students in this current generation. So to avoid waste of resources and to also avoid um, repeated um, or double efforts in things that are being addressed. 
And the other thing I want to talk about is um, understanding what uh, the contextual meaning of what free education is in every region. So for example, um, in the Gambia, what free education could mean by those implementing these, um, uh, those directly implementing the education level in each country, uh, in the Gambia, might differ from what free education means in Senegal or in Tanzania or in Nigeria. So um, in the Gambia, I know we have a lot of uh, government schools and apparently it's free education. But what free education in the Gambia context means is not paying tuition fees. And we all know what um, students face different challenges. We have a really, really um, a huge number of students who find it, who comes from families who find it really hard to even have three meals a day. And they, they have to worry about buying books. They have to worry about buying uniforms. They have to worry about uh, paying for exam fees and stuff like that. So their parents have to worry about feeding their families. They also have to worry about taking them to school. And in a lot of situations, they end up just sending them to school. And when they go to school, some teachers do not even understand, oh, this person is from a different background from this other person. But no, you're supposed to have it. You don't have it, leave my class. And at the end of the day, they cannot learn anything. And they end up being, they end up not passing their exams, which is like, which is another thing I'm gonna choice that for example they don't even want to be teachers they're there because they don't have any other choice because maybe they want to be lawyers or they wanted to be something but that's not they're not getting it so they end up being teachers because that's the only choice available for them and then with that type of perspective how they think they're going to teach the students it, it, i'm there because I'm, i need the money it's not because i want to be teaching you so they just do what they want and the students end up suffering and then the education system ends up failing so this is why, I, um, firstly, that's why I try to address that we should look for the root causes and not just focus on the surface things that we're seeing. So also, if we, even though maybe, I can remember when I was much younger, I, I told my mom that I wanted to be a teacher, and she was almost laughing because teaching is apparently not something that I should dream about. And then I think with that, even, even though we some of the teachers that we're having right now, to try and invest in training them so they can become professionals. And to also try and encourage them because we also need to understand that teachers are very important pillars in our society. All of us pass through teachers. We have the first ladies, we have the presidents, we have doctors who are becoming very important people in the society. They all pass through teachers. So we also need to encourage these teachers to tell them that we're not taking what they're doing for granted. To, for example, we could encourage them by providing them with incentives that could actually motivate them to be there for actually, um, because they actually want to be there, not because of just, um, it's a last choice option or a cause of survival. And the other thing I want to talk about is, like I talked about earlier, that education is more than the four corners of a classroom. Education is beyond that. Um, but in formal education, most of the time that we see is classroom based and what we do is to just go to school and then learn a specific syllabus and then study that specific syllabus and pass exam. That's, that's the method, that's how it's done. And it's just more about passing exams and then moving to the next grade. It's not focused on trying to develop students, on trying to develop young people to become best versions of themselves so when they graduate they become more self-reliant instead of just roaming about into government and look for jobs and if they don't have it, they end up being frustrated. Some of them go back ways, some of them bring other stuff that um, is being detrimental to the entire society. So I think what needs to be done, um, those governments and um, those committed to providing investing in free quality education should maybe try to allocate a specific percentage of these funds to providing facilities and resources for extracurricular activities um, for the that, that's gonna uh, contribute to building the life development and leadership skills of young girls and even young boys. So not only today, but because we need to understand that they, they're gonna be the future leaders who are gonna run this country and the entire world to, even today to tomorrow. So um, that's another thing I think it needs, um, also needs to be considered while thinking about policies or maybe investments that you want to make that providing free and quality education. And the last point that I would like to address is to also consider having a very flexible sustainability so that people coming after us are likely to. In the 18th century, the generation in the 18th century, compared to now, most of them were not um, 
must be exposed to the digital generation. So this generation obviously up currently is the digital generation and everything that happens, everything that's happening is all revolves around the digital um, generation. So I think uh, one thing that we should do right now is to try and strategize and look for sustainable plans that's gonna suit every um, available solution or every available generation so they can connect with it, so they can know um, how to be able to work with, um, closely with the things that they have provided. So if we try to look for digital solutions, to try to change the educational system, it's much more gonna be effective than if we're going to just concentrate on what we want and the kind um, that we um, that. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, Fatima, for the clear demonstration on how to center adolescent girls and young women in policy and programmatic actions. And thank you for the five very concrete points. Um, we now move to Ms. Horei Mabadu